Hi everyone, welcome to the April edition of Cybar. Now, of course, I'm always very grateful to all of our audience that show up to our events, but I am especially grateful to everyone that's shown up tonight because tonight's event is the first one that we have held since the pubs in the UK reopened for outdoor service. So I very much appreciate the fact that right now you could be freezing outside in a beer garden, but instead you have chosen to be here um, to listen to some science tonight. Or maybe you are in a beer garden. Um, if you're choosing to... Um, stream us straight to the pub, um, I'd be very interested to know, so feel free to let us know in the chat. So as the world is sort of slowly inching back towards normality, um, we are still obviously coming to you online, um, and we will be for the immediate future, but we have certainly started talking um, about the next event that we can hold in person, so we're certainly discussing sort of when and where, um, and of course, for our lovely audience members, if you have any ideas where you'd like to see a live sidebar event, um, please do let us know. Um, you can stick, us in, stick it in the chat um, and tell us if there's any way you'd prefer to see um, a bit of science brought to you by Palace of Science. But until then, we're still online. Um, and still with the added advantage, um, once again, of this talk, tonight's talk is uh, being recorded. So tonight's speakers very kindly agreed um, to let us record the talk and it will be added to the Palace of Science YouTube channel. So um, if you have to dash off or if you want to watch the talk again or recommend it to a friend, um, then you can, of course, find that on the Palace of Science YouTube channel. So for anyone that hasn't been to one of these events um, before, it's the same setup as always. Um, tonight's talk will be about 30 minutes long and then we will take a short five minute break um, where you, the audience, can enjoy um, a great quiz that have been put together by one of our lovely volunteers, Anna. Um, and then we'll be back for a question and answer session. So if you do have any questions for tonight's speaker, um, please just stick them in the chat and we'll come to them at the end. And of course, um, as I said, you can uh, watch this talk and all of our previous talks back um, on the YouTube channel. And in terms of future in-person events, you can follow all of the Palace of Science social media to find out more about that. So um, I think that's everything I need to sort of cover for now. Um, without further ado, I will present tonight's speaker. So um, he is a professor of geochemistry in the Department of Earth Sciences at Durham University um, and I've been really intrigued about what he's going to talk about tonight um, because I get the impression he's going to talk about essentially how life evolved from rocks which I think is quite a big feat to fit into a 30-minute talk so I'm very interested to see what he has to say um, but as I said if you have any questions then please do stick them in the chat we'll come to them at the end so if you'll please give a warm virtual welcome to Professor Chris Greenwell. Thank you very much indeed, Nicola. That's a great introduction, and thank you to Palace of Science for inviting me tonight to give this talk. I'm joining you from my uh, home bar, as it were, in, in my kitchen at home, and uh, the first drink of the evening is not scotch on the rocks, but polymerization on the rocks, uh, from geochemistry to biochemistry, which is the title of my talk. So, um, in my research, I spend a lot of time looking in a laboratory at various minerals and how organic matter or organic molecules stick to those minerals. Sometimes it happens to be herbicide, sometimes it's pesticide, sometimes it's uh, to do with the oil and gas sector. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk about a, a field of work that we've revisit whenever we can because it's a great area to be working in, which is trying to understand how life uh, evolved on planet Earth and what it means for us and uh, what it means for the potential of discovering life elsewhere. So, some questions to ask ourselves. When it's, it's a very broad topic. Where do we start? How do we begin to think about how life began? I mean, one prosaic question, I guess, is why are we interested in understanding the origin of life? Where does this get us? We're going to follow this up a little bit with what is life anyway? How do we define life? That becomes a surprisingly difficult topic to try and address in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, when did life start? What do we know about the earliest life on Earth? Where did it start? What was its home? What does that tell us about the potential for life on other planets? And what does it tell us about what that life might have looked like? And then we're going to have a look at how did life start 
and what were the ingredients. And it's really towards the bottom of that list that my own research comes in. So most of what I will be giving is, is an introduction to a, a very broad um, endeavour in, in science that has been going on um, since man began to understand and think about his, his origins. So, the first thing we're going to have a look at is, well, why are we interested in understanding the origin of life? Where does this actually get us in the first place? So this is one of the most used photographs uh, in, from NASA's repository of photographs, and it's called Earthrise. Uh, this was from the Apollo 8 uh, program. And as, as this uh, Earth came up over the surface of the moon, which is in the foreground, so uh, the, the astronaut at the time uttered, oh my God, look at that picture over there. Here's the Earth coming up. Wow, isn't that pretty? And that was Bill Anders on Christmas Eve, 1968. That's quite some Christmas present, isn't it? So, and nothing more can kind of illustrate the difference in the uh, rather bleak and rocky looking surface of the moon in the foreground and the blue, green, browny, yellowy planet just rising out from the blackness in the background with all of the white swirling cloud. The difference between a planet that is hosting life and one which is barren couldn't be uh, made more succinctly. So here's another photo from the uh, NASA archives. So this is the last photo from the Voyager 1 program. And if you're looking about center screen, then there's a little pale dot. That pale dot is the planet Earth taken on Valentine's Day 1990, when Voyager was just about 4 billion miles away, looking back down at Earth. Just after that point, they towered down the cameras, and that pale blue dot is uh, a, a very lyrically described in Carl Sagan's book of the same name. And there's a little picture of the Voyager spacecraft in the top left hand corner. So why are we showing you these pictures? Well, it's to show you that in all of the areas that are covered in those two photos, that blackness in the first one and the vastness of space in the second one, that tiny fragment of a dot, it's about a tenth of a pixel of, of the entire image that makes up the photograph taken by Voyager. That is the only place we know for certain that life exists. So understanding how rare and how precious life is drives us towards a hope that if we understand how it forms, we may care about our planet a little bit better going forward, and it may help us have some hope for the future of our planet. So a little closer to home than that photo. Here's one taken this week, 25th of April, in fact, so three days ago. And this is, of course, showing the excellent uh, footage from um, the Perseverance rover uh, on Mars at the moment. And just about center photo up at the top, you can see the Ingenuity um, a helicopter hovering over the surface of Mars, um, again, searching for signatures of life and trying to understand aspects of Mars' surface geochemistry. So in understanding the rareness of life in the universe and the uniqueness of it on Earth, we now are beginning to be able to have the technology to travel to and see whether life may have at once, if not now, at least once have existed on our nearest planet, which is in the similar sort of habitable zone in space. Another shot, again, very recently, December 2020. Hayabusa 2, the spacecraft in the foreground, approaches Ryugu, the asteroid, several million miles out again um, from planet Earth. So Ryugu, uh, is an interesting one. It's a very carbon rich asteroid. And the Hayabusa 2 probe was able to obtain samples of that asteroid and then we turn to an Earth orbit and deliver those samples down to Earth for analysis. It's only the second time samples have been obtained for an asteroid for analysis on Earth, other than material which has already crashed into the Earth. And more than anything else, this will tell us about what is present in the universe in terms of the precursors to life as we know it on Earth and give us a feel for how much of that material may have been delivered to Earth extraterrestrially. So, what is life anyway? Well, 
This is going back a, a degree of simplicity. This is actually a sheet that my uh, daughter was working on one day, and I had a quick look over her shoulder, and I thought that would be useful one day for a talk. So here it is. And she was asked to categorize living and non-living. So our understanding of life and when we teach our children about life begins at a rather young age. In, in her case, she was about eight. And as you can see here, there's a whole range of different things, some of which are clearly living, crocodiles, zebras, fish, dragonfly, bird, frog. And they learn about the characteristics of living things, such as a movement, excretion, respiration, reproduction, irritability, nutrition and growth. So we can work through these things, and some are definitely fitting all of those categories. Others have some of them. So we have a skateboard that might move, but it certainly doesn't reproduce. And to my knowledge, has never shown any irritability. And then things like mushrooms are a bit strange because they don't appear to move very much. Um, but we know that they are, in fact, living things. So trying to categorize life from non-life when it's macroscopic like that is, is somewhat easy, though finding something that fits all of the criteria can be sometimes more difficult. When we look at more esoteric examples, such as the ones in this slide, it's not always obvious what things are living and what things aren't, even when we look at them in high resolution as these images are. So this is normally where I play if we were standing around this in a pub, the odd one out game, um, and we try and figure out which ones are living and non-living. People tend to think the one on the right of the screen, so that's the sort of gray colored image. I'm hoping everything's uh, um, in the same orientation as I'm looking at it when you're looking at it, is um, in fact not living. It's calcite crystals. So it's a kind of scale that grows inside your kettle or in pipes if you live in a hard water area. So it has some very complex and biological looking forms to it, but it's in fact completely inorganic. There's actually nothing living about it. It's calcium carbonate. The one in the middle is a lichen, and that's an interesting mix of living and non-living. The, there's a, a, a um, part of it which is uh, living, and, and then that's sort of uh, um, uh, combined with a part of it which is, is there just as a, a, a sort of um, to give it some stability. And then on the other side of it, you have these strand-like structures which look very biological, but they're in fact they're a type of clay mineral, which is the thing that I specialize in researching. That's known as hairy illite and grows in rocks in oil reservoirs. Hmm. It can get even harder when we look at things which are um, beyond our visual scale. So here we have two images which to all intents and purposes look exactly the same. Whereas, in fact, one of them is living and one of them is not living. The one on the right labeled D. discoidum is actually a bacteria and it forms these fantastic patterns when it grows on a plate. And the one on the left is actually a chemical reaction in a similar sort of Petri plate on a, a light. And it's called the belusov zabotinsky reaction. Like life, the belusov zabotinsky reaction is far from equilibrium, so it's quite a dynamic process. It hasn't when life reaches equilibrium, it's generally because it's just expired and died and decayed. Um, so we have to keep putting things into life to keep it going. And the belusov zabotinsky reaction is the same. It's a very complex reaction involving cerium in two oxidation states, but it also forms these beautiful spirals and patterns. So as well as the, the characteristics of life, mering, there are also other ways we can start thinking about how we define life. And one of them, of course, was uh, given by the work of, first of all, Charles Darwin um, on the left hand side and Gregor Mendel, who actually slightly predated Darwin on the right hand side. And um, they were interested in how species evolved and adapted to a new environment. Darwin's finches are, of course, famous. And Darwin was able to begin to rationalize that an initial uh, finch species in the middle, which was used to feeding on seeds, had arrived in the Galapagos and had began to evolve so that it was able to feed on various other um, organisms. And as it did so, its beak evolved to give these different shapes that you see in the picture, uh, from ones evolved quite dagger-like to feed on grubs um, and insects, ones that are able to enable the bird to hold tools, um, and others that could eat soft fruit. At the same time, Gregor Mendel, uh, Gregor Mendel sorry, was um, looking at pea plants and was able to 
uh, see that if he combined the pea plants in certain ways, he could end up with different proportions of certain characteristics which are listed there in the image, whether they were tall or short, whether the flowers were white or purple, uh, whether the uh, peas were yellow or green or wrinkled or smooth. And he was able to build a sort of mathematical understanding of what happens when you cross different pea plants with each other. They were both ahead of their time, of course, and what they were sort of moving towards was understanding that something that was passed on from parents to offspring was influencing the way that these evolved over a great time period and um, able to respond to external forces within the environment. The reason that this was happening became apparent when um, Watson and Crick with uh, Rosalind Franklin doing the X-ray crystallography. So Watson and Crick were scientists at Cambridge University and Franklin was at King's College London. And they began to understand that uh, the molecular basis of inheritance that Darwin and Mendel were beginning to describe through their qualitative descriptions. And we'll be able to build a somewhat mechanical model. That's the photo of it on the left from the Science Museum, which actually has some of the original metalwork from the Watson and Crick famous model in it, of deoxyribose nucleic acid or DNA, which is the molecular basis of all of our encoding as a human being or indeed any organism, the thing that tells us which proteins will form and um, how they will manifest themselves in the eventual organism. So you can see the characteristic twin spiral, uh, twin helix structure of DNA with a nuclear basis pairing across the middle like the rungs of a ladder. And the way that the inheritance, of course, works is the two strands can unravel from each other and begin to replicate themselves, which then get passed in to the offspring. So we begin to move to an understanding of what's required to, of life when we begin to understand that all life that we know of on Earth is cellular. So we can see some unicellular microalgae, another organism I've done some work on in the top left of that um, cell. These are organisms that are about a micrometer across, which is um, a thousandth of a millimeter, very small. And within that single cell, we have this sort of sketch in the middle. There's a whole lot of complex structures. You have a cell wall, which is a bag which holds the cytoplasm, the cell liquid within it. And that liquid is essential for all of the cell machinery to work. And that in itself gives us a hint that life must have evolved in an aqueous environment. Uh, we can see the RNA and DNA, the nucleic acid, which contain the genetic material within the cell, within the nucleus, the initial DNA, and then the RNA feeds that out into the cell where um, protein synthesis occurs. At the bottom right-hand corner, we can see a protein, an enzyme, the biological catalyst that make all of our reactions work in our body. The other thing that's unique about life on Earth is on the bottom left, is that we can see there's a, um, all biology on Earth has this phenomenon of chirality. All carbon can form two mirror images which are non-superimposable with each other. So if you look at the molecules held in each of those hands, they're a mirrored image of each other, but if you try to overlay one with the other exactly, you can't do that. And almost all life has levo amino acids or L amino acids and D carbohydrates or sugars. And this refers to the way in which they rotate a plain polarized light. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's a unique characteristic of life. When you try and make many molecules synthetically without life being involved, you get a mixture of both of those, whereas life will only ever use one of them. So defining life, we've seen is surprisingly complex. And having spent a great team of time thinking about it, the NASA Astrobiology Institute defined life as a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. So we know that cells, an organism, a single-celled organism, which is about as simple as organisms get, is able to replicate and evolve. But what about simpler systems? Well, after the discovery of DNA, one of the next uh, Nobel Prizes in nucleic acid biochemistry was awarded the second Altman. So they discovered the other form of nucleic acid, ribose nucleic acid in cells, has an unusual property. It can also catalyze its own production. So whereas DNA can't actually, without a bunch of other complex machinery, replicate itself, ribose nucleic acid in the form of ribozymes, which is a sort of a blending of the enzyme word, which is a biological catalyst, and uh, 
uh, ribonucleic acid to give ribozymes is able to catalyze its own production. And this eventually led to the idea by Walter Gilbert of the RNA world, where the first ecosystem, as it were, consisted nothing more than RNA evolving um, and, and replicating itself as a primary genetic material. And this has been a sort of mainstay of origins of life chemistry for many years. Of course, the question comes next of where on earth did the RNA come from in the first place? So having grappled with what life is anyway and what the simplest forms life may be anyway, we can get onto the topic of when did life start? Now, this is one of my favorite images, which is why it's on the front of the slide. And it sort of captures many elements of origins of life chemistry. I believe it was first used by and developed by Leslie Orgel at the Salk Institute, one of the uh, great minds in, in origins of life thinking. And it shows a sort of a snapshot of everything we begin to think about in origins of life chemistry. We have the space in the background, the whole universe. Uh, we have big gas nebulae where um, some chemistry, chemical synthesis may be happening and collapsing stars. We have meteorites shooting across the sky and asteroids. And then we have sunlight um, streaming down onto the planet Earth here with its atmosphere beginning to develop. Over on the left, we have volcanoes which are releasing energy um, and generating all sorts of gases which might be able to be used in chemical synthesis from deep within the Earth. Um, these are getting rained down and reacted with lightning, which is a very intense energy source. And then getting dissolved in the water down at the bottom left of the image that you can see. And in the water, we have these very simple chemicals with the sort of green, the red, the blue and the yellow all joined together in the left hand corner. These begin to merge into the uh, slightly more complex proto biomolecules, I guess, the things that came before RNA and DNA. The RNA and the DNA, we can see the characteristic uh, helixes of DNA there form, and eventually some simple form of life, single cellular, becomes multicellular as we move up this white river of time, or evolutionary river, into more complex amoeba-like organisms, until eventually we can see uh, the dinosaurs climbing out um, onto land there, the Diplodocus and the Tyrannosaurus rex and the uh, pterodactyls, all the way up through primitive people up to the observatory on the top of the hill where mankind today dares to look back and begin to think about how we evolved in the first place. And we see all the different biomes on the planet, across the planet. We have mountains with snow, we have volcanoes, extinct volcanoes, rivers and marshes and deltas. So this is a, a useful snapshot of, of all the things that we're trying to address when we're looking at origins of life. What we really want to do now, though, is begin to think about how do we actually begin to understand the time scales involved and particularly down this sort of left hand bottom end. How long ago was it that we had cellular life on Earth and what came before it? So where do we start when we're trying to understand time in, in uh, monitoring time from early in the Earth's history? Well, uranium actually comes to our uh, savior here, not in a form of an energy source, but in the form of giving us a handle on being able to date very old things and particularly very old rocks. So we just need to have a little bit of a, a visit of uranium uh, and its decay. So uranium we know is a um, radioactive substance. All radioactive substances have a half-life which measures their decay. What do we mean when we talk about radioactive decay? Well, at the top here, um, between the two elemental symbols uh, from the Royal Society of Chemistry um, periodic table, interactive periodic table, we have a, a model of our atom of uranium with a nucleus which contains neutrons and protons in yellow and orange and the electrons whizzing around it. We have a pathway in the blue and orange, again showing our neutrons and protons, where we have uranium-235 at the start of the pathway. Now, because uranium-235 is uh, unstable and therefore radioactive, it begins to emit um, helium nuclei, you can see coming out uh, along the first arrow, and electrons as it decays. So its first decay is to thorium, and then it begins to lose more neutrons. And because you're losing parts of the nucleus, you're actually changing the mass of the element, and therefore where it sits in the periodic table, it's an entirely new element that's formed during radioactive decay. And over time, it decays through various stages until it stops decaying. The nuclei is stable when it reaches lead 207 at the bottom right there. 
Now, it does this in a very predictable way. And if we look at the graph in the top right, uh, we have um, the percent of the material and we have both uranium with the green line and lead with the black line, and then millions of years on the time scale on the bottom line. And the half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of the uranium to convert to lead is about 700 and something uh, million years there. So about three quarters of a billion years. So how do we use this? Well, we then look at another mineral, and this is a quite a fascinating one called zircon. And it's a zirconium silicate. And we can see uh, the nice red big sample of it in the bottom left hand corner there. That's a mineral, a, a sort of gem grade zircon in a host of calcite, which is the yellow fluffy stuff, another mineral. But it's really the red one we're interested in. So zircons are unusual. They're very, very hard and they're very, very dense. So they're very hard to destroy. And they tend to sink in melts and things to become incorporated in other molten rock. And they have an unusual property. They will allow uranium to be uptaken into their structure, but they don't uptake lead into the structure. So because there's no lead in there from the external environment, any lead that gets into those crystals has to come from the decay of uranium. And we know that that's a case according to a very um, prescribed half-life. So by able to buy, if we have a zircon crystal, we can then look at the late to a uranium ratio and we will know how many years old that crystal is. If we look in the electron micrograph at the top left, you can see these things grow in like a layered structure with each layer maybe representing thousands of years. And each one of those will capture a certain bit of information about the environment. The other thing we need to note is that if we find a zircon crystal in the middle of a hard rock, then that zircon crystal must have been there at the time the rock formed. It can't have got into it after the rock was hard. So we know that it's the oldest part of the rock. So what we do is, as they put the, uh, the images on the right hand side, is when we get a um, old bit of rock, we can look inside it with an electron microscope for um, a zircon crystal, and then which are in the bright white colors in A, B, C, and D. We can then look at the zircon crystal with um, an elemental analysis part of the electron microscope and work out the lead and um, uranium ratios, and then we can work out from that what the dates are as given in the right hand series of images there in millions of years. So we have essentially a clock within a rock. And using that on some rocks from the Jack Hills formation in um, Australia, we see our picture of the Earth here. We think the Earth is about 4.5 billion years or thereabouts old. And these are the oldest rocks on Earth. That crystal with the zircons in it will tell us that the Earth is about 4.4 billion years old at least. So that's 4.4 thousand million years of history. We know that for life to be able to evolve, if it used a similar biochemistry today, we needed water. And there's just been some recent work put into the uh, European Geo um, Chemistry Union Conference um, this last week, which shows that um, it's an artist impression of, of Earth, the early Earth in the uh, Archeon period, the Hayden to Archeon period, which is some of the very earliest parts of Earth history. You can see it's uh, the artist has it as part molten still, but already water is beginning to form on the distal part of the planet, and it's pockmarked by um, meteorite strikes as well at the same time. But the evolution, the, the Earth is thought to become hydrated about three and a half billion years ago, um, to 3.8 billion years ago. So what we can do then is begin to look for rocks which have fossils in them, which may be very old, and where the fossils may indicate that life existed. And some of the earliest um, fossils that have been found on Earth, using the zircon dating again, in the middle here we see stromatolites, um, and here we see modern day ones in the inset actually, both, both in Australia, one is fossilized, the yellowy gray one in the main image, and then the real, the living, the, the present day ones are up on the upper right. And these are essentially microbial mats uh, or, um, cyanobacterial mats that are covered with minerals, layers of minerals to give this layered type structure. And they get preserved. And these have been dated back to about 3.4 billion years ago. In other rocks in Greenland, um, Hassan Kamatal looked, uh, and you can see by the red arrow, a sort of dark um, structure within it. They looked at carbon within that using a very sensitive microscope called an atomic force microscope and suggested that this was uh, again, proof of the existence of life being fossilized within it. 
something of biogenic origin. And those rocks are around 3.8 billion years old. And then the apex chert microfossils on the left, and they all certainly look very biological structures. Um, these fossils are thought to be about 3.4 billion years old. However, we have to be slightly cautious in our interpretation of the fossil record. And this stuck in my memory from when I was a, a, um, a lot younger by the uh, cartoonist Johnny Hart. And we can see that the uh, caveman is putting a monopod set of footprints in the lava to drive people out of their minds in millions of years from now. And uh, that it is with the fossil record. When you're looking at small amorphized bits of carbon stuck within the middle of a rock, it's very hard to be definitive that they are in fact um, biological in nature and not formed by some other process. And the, uh, particularly the apex chert ones, which were thought to be the oldest fossils known at about 3.46 million years ago, a billion years ago, sorry, um, were in fact proven to be um, nothing more than uh, carbon that had been entrained in hydrothermal fluids and altered. These were reanalyzed several times over with a slightly different interpretation coming up each time. But the present day uh, interpretation of this rock is that these layered structures you can see down at the bottom left are actually clay minerals coated in organic matter, which is why it looks biological. The other way that people come from a biological angle tend to try and understand how a long life has been around on Earth is by looking at divergence in genomes between um, simple organisms and understanding how long ago these might have diverged. And one of the things we find is that at about 2.8 Billion years ago, um, the first cyanobacteria became uh, present on Earth in a significant way. Um, and that's uh, indicated by both the rock record, where you can see a banded iron formation rock at top right. And the interesting thing about that is up to that point, um, iron had been mainly dissolved. And all of a sudden, as oxygen began to appear on Earth in significant quantities, then the iron began to form iron oxides and these uh, large rock structures. So this is put down to the first photosynthetic organisms appearing, the cyanobacteria. And in a sense, they probably had one of the biggest environmental disasters uh, the Earth has known. Because even though everything on Earth today, or more or less everything, needs oxygen to live, then at that time, oxygen was in fact a pretty nasty pollutant. Anything living there before had managed quite well without it. And using this molecular clock approach, we get an idea the last universal common ancestor of life, so the cellular organism, was about 3,800 billion uh, or million years ago, 3.8 billion years ago. When we want to go beyond that, though, the fossil record's never going to preserve things like the um, ribozyme uh, world, the RNA world of Gilbert. So the great chemist Albert Eschenoza came up with a profound statement of the origin of life cannot be discovered. It has to be invented. You will never be able to find anything in a fossil record that shows you that um, what the initial organisms were prior to single cellular organisms or I mean, single cellular organism. And that's where we come in as chemists. So we're going to have a little bit of a think now about um, where did life start? And this has got a lot to do with what was the environment like. And again, it's something that people have grappled with, with a, for a while. Um, this is, again, in a pub, one of those great um, explain the relationship uh, pictures. And do we know who the person in the uh, portrait is? Now, that's, in fact, Robert Boyle. And then the next question is, well, what has he got to do with uh, kittens? And of course, Boyle was very interested in the properties of gases. So one of the things we do when thinking about life is, well, what does life need to exist? And the reason that Boyle got involved with kittens was he developed some of the first vacuum pumps and they would put a kitten inside a bell jar and pump all the air out of it. Um, and then before the poor animal had expired, they would let all the air back in and they would see them revive again and thus prove that whatever was in air was certainly something that uh, an organism like a kitten needed to survive. Um, in an era before Game Boys and television, this became quite a parlor trick and people actually began to do it as a, a way of creating entertainment. And here is another image from 1768 by uh, J. Wright in Tate Britain showing a dove um, being put to uh, um, unconsciousness by a similar apparatus with the, the family watching entranced uh, and paying the person who is doing this. So we, we get an idea that environment is important for beginning to understand 
where life may or may not exist. So if we look at environments on Earth, where do we find microorganisms? And the answer to that is essentially just about everywhere. Deep in the Earth, high in the atmosphere, um, and in every extreme environment you can think of. And indeed, a lot of origins of life research involves understanding how extremophiles have coped with their environment and shown adaptation to it. So we have the Firehole Spring in Yellowstone National Park in the top. This is incredibly acidic, more acidic than your car battery. Um, if you have a petrol powered car, that is, I should say, an internal combustion powered car rather than a lithium ion battery powered Tesla. So your sulfuric acid, lead acid battery is about pH 2, and these springs are more or less the same as that. Very acidic. They're also very hot. They're about 80 um, degrees plus. So that's way hotter than your boiler would be running normally in your house. So you would certainly scald yourself into a kettle just off the boil, essentially. Yet life manages to thrive there and these different colors, different types of algae that we see. Life also exists in the, um, and of course, one of the great discoveries uh, of the last century in terms of um, understanding life on Earth was the black smoker environment we see at bottom left out of the viewport of the Alvin Submersible from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, they discovered these things just near where the Earth's crust separates under the oceans, and these um, Volcanic vents seem to be spewing out this black colored smoke, but it's actually fluid enriched with metal sulfides. And that's about 400 degrees Celsius and also very acidic. There is no natural sunlight there, so photosynthesis can't occur, but entire ecosystems live off the chemical energy delivered by those vent systems. You also have life existing in the extremes of the salt flats and salt deserts of South America, that's Bolivia there. And uh, recent work is showing that you can take um, organisms which have been preserved in the salts for thousands of years and um, restart them. Other areas which have come uh, increasingly of interest in, in the last few years are these um, white smokers. So these are again undersea volcanoes, but they're much colder than the black smokers. And instead of being acidic, they're alkaline. So they tend to be about 90 degrees Celsius. The pH tends up to be up at about uh, pH 10 or 11, and you get these massive mounds of precipitated minerals as a result where you have alkali conditions. You tend to get lots of hydroxide minerals and carbonates. And these plumes are rich in hydrogen and hydrocarbons fed by a type of geochemistry called serpentinization underneath them. And that's interesting because what you want to begin to build your first molecules on Earth is hydrogen and some way of turning um, the most stable form of carbon, which is carbon dioxide, into a hydrogenated carbon, which is needed in all biomolecules. So I'm going to now move on to the bits of work where we tend to look at things in my group, and that's how you took these first simple uh, uh, molecules, which to all intents and purpose are inorganic, they're not what we would call an a, a organic molecule, and how those began to assemble into first organic molecules, which were very small, and then into biomolecules, which were larger. Now, in a letter to J.D. Hooker, Darwin had already began to think about this, and he sort of phrased, was well, some warm little ponds with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts. Of course, we need nitrogen and phosphate in, in living organisms, a bit of light, heat, electricity, etc. <coughs> Excuse me, in his letter to J.D. Hooker. And it actually took a bit of a conceptual leap by the person in the top right hand corner, uh, who's Vola, and his claim to fame is synthesizing uh, urea, the molecule that is the main constitutor of urine, and that's also, of course, great in a pub setting because, um, well, we'll leave it at that. But until Vola had made urea, it was considered that it was impossible to make organic molecules without biology. So in a bit of a chicken and egg conundrum, how did you get biology without being able to make organic molecules? And of course, at that time, um, people were still very much of the mind that that life was something that was div created divinely. Uh, whereas Vola was be able to show that actually you can make organic molecules from very simple inorganic ingredients. And of course, that was then picked up on by Yuri and Miller in their classic experiment in the top left here and in the middle, where they took some gases, simple gases, which are inorganic, nothing uh, biological about them. They put them in a vessel in the top middle there where it says gases to represent the upper atmosphere of the early Earth. 
They then put uh, some wires in it and had a discharge to mimic lightning. They fired lightning through this while circulating water vapor. And over time, the trap at the bottom trapped out all of the different um, bio uh, or the different organic molecules that they had managed to make without using biology in the first place, including almost all of the amino acids that life needs and then some more again. So in the early Earth, we understand to have been quite wet. It had, it had uh, oceans, but it also had some sort of continental crust. We think where early weathering, this is what came out of the EGU industry and was able to deliver minerals into the um, oceans. And those oceans might have contained significant amounts of very simple biomolecules like the amino acids, which make up our proteins. However, for those to become proteins, they need to get together. And to do that, you need to be able to get them in sufficient concentrations that they can condense and form bigger molecules. So almost all biomolecules are formed by condensation reactions or biopolymers, I should say, where you remove water between two amino acids to form it. Of course, this is inherently difficult when you're surrounded by water. And of course, the joke on the tin of soup is it says condensed primordial soup because it's no good having a dilute one if you're going to make anything out of it. So where do we have on the early Earth where we could bring molecules together in sufficient concentrations that they could begin to react with one another to form bigger protobiomolecules? And these are electron micrographs we see now of different mineral systems. So um, on the left, we have a, a, an etched feldspar, and you can see it has all of these channels and tunnels running through it. And these are on the micrometer scale. So these are surfaces with huge surface area where small organic molecules might concentrate and be able to be reacted with one another, yet protected from the intense ultraviolet radiation of the early Earth, which would immediately degrade them back the other way again. Similarly, we see these clay tubules on modern um, hydrothermal systems off the coast of Iceland. It's the work by Gettner et al. And in one of the most profound and probably one of the most uptaken um, theories around origins of life is this work by Mike Russell um, and Bill Martin and Alida Hall back in the um, 1990s, where they showed the sort of cells that we can see here are not actually biological. They are part of iron sulfide um, bubbles and froths at submarine hydrothermal um, systems. And they built up this whole origins of life hypothesis we see in the right hand image, where gases go in at the bottom of these uh, sort of cellular reactors and then build up and react to form biomolecule, protobiomolecules as it goes through the system, including even the lipids to make cell membranes, which then get released as the iron sulfide dissolves into the more acidic seawater at the top of it. Again, this is an alkaline hydrothermal vent like the white smokers we showed. And the idea coupled nicely uh, with the then um, not so old discovery of the alkaline hydrothermal seeps um, on the mid, uh, the um, ocean, mid ocean ridges systems off axis uh, vent systems. So, okay, so we get towards and the bit of work that I do, I don't work on iron sulfides, but my team spends a lot of work looking at layered minerals, uh, such as clay minerals. These are interesting. People who know, have them in their soil, will know that their garden will dry out in the summer and shrink massively, um, but will also swell and turn to gloop in the winter. And that's because these rocks are actually not very hard and they're arranged in layers. So if we have a look at the images here, we see some clay in the vial. And when we look at that from above, we see it has a hexagonal look and it's quite plate-like, as in it's very thin um, when viewed from the side, as in the next image along. So the interesting thing about these clay minerals is that when we think of early biomolecules, they were known to be very fragile and no one could quite understand of how they would have evolved on the early Earth without some sort of protection. And the quote there is from a final report of a NASA astrobiology a workshop about RNA. The other kind of biomolecules, of course, are peptides, such, which are formed from amino acids, such as being searched uh, for by the Ryugo probe. And they're also being delivered to Earth by meteorites, such as the uh, Murchison meteorite, which was um, pristine when it was opened and discovered to contain, again, a significant number of the amino acids used, or in fact, all of the amino acids used by biology on the Earth. Amino acids are also known to be synthesized in these hydrothermal vent uh, systems using reactors to mimic it. 
So they need to be brought together and um, reacted such that they can uh, form a polymer that will then be resilient. And the quote here is essentially saying that by George Wald, who's a Nobel laureate and a Harvard biologist, who said, trying to understand the origin of life via this sort of condensation of amino acids stepwise has a small amount of probability, um, hence may occur over a long stretch of time. But the undoing of those proteins, the dissolution, is far more probable. And he, ana the analogy he uses is Penelope waiting for Odysseus to come home from the wars, where each day she weaves some fabric to, dis uh, to, to occupy her time and to prevent suitors um, wooing her by saying when she finishes the fabric, she will consider their suit. But then each evening she undoes it all and starts again the next day. And it was summed up even more prosaically in a cartoon uh, by Sidney Harris, an American scientist, who said, people think of origin of life this way, where two amino acids drift together three and a half billion years ago, um, but then six seconds later they drift apart, and then perhaps, you know, 480,000, uh, 480 million years later, they sort of drift together again. And that's just showing the problems of when you think of these things reacting without some sort of reactor vessel or mineral to help them react. And my group has spent the last 10 years looking at the way that um, layered minerals, such as the picture in the bottom right there, can concentrate the amino acids, which are the gray things between the pink and red layers. And they can do that very effectively, particularly under alkali pHs as favored by these white smokers. We have also helped understand how the catalysis happens. So here we see a surface in gray and red or gray and yellow, and we're comparing how um, the DNA can be induced to polymerize on mineral surfaces and looking at the difference between different minerals. We also find that minerals can accelerate the folding. So for those of you who have a biological background, you'll understand that all large molecules, uh, biomolecules have a, um, a quaternary structure defined by their folding and their hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. Well, this folding can happen much quicker on mineral surfaces than it can just in solution. And lastly, but not least, these mineral surfaces can fold around and drape. They're very flexible when we're looking at layered minerals. They're not so much like a rock. We tend to think of rocks as hard as like biological systems in the first place. And within this region, you can get different reactions occurring where chemicals are brought together and can react with both the mineral surface and other um, molecules to create bigger molecules. OK. So overall, these layered minerals we can think of as a protective kind of womb where organic molecules on the early Earth could have come together to form the first protobiomolecules and then been stabilized against reaction with the early Earth conditions. Okay, so just to conclude, we'll revisit our blackboard and we've had a look at uh, why we might be interested in understanding the origin of life. We've had to think about how do we even think about defining what life is in the first place. How do we know when it started? Where did it start? And indeed, how did it start? And I've given you sort of a whistle top steer over a very small segment of origins of life research, but nevertheless, I hope that it's uh, been informative. And now I urge you to try your quiz and uh, have your drink. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chris. That was great. As I said at the start of the talk, I was wondering exactly how you were planning to cover the origins of life in about half an hour um, and I think you did uh, an excellent job there in fact so good um, about 20 minutes of that talk covered I think the first two years of my undergraduate degree so I'm <laughs> worried I have definitely overspent on that <laughs> um, I certainly have a few questions um, but of course those will come in the question and answer session um, if anyone in the audience does have any questions please stick them in the chat box um, for anyone out there that needs to rush off, um, before you go, I will just let you know that we do have another sidebar um, lined up in May. It will be on the 19th of May, Wednesday the 19th of May. It is by a research fellow at Newcastle University and she will be talking to us about smart zombies. So this, these are um, the Internet of Things um, being essentially worried about whether your alarm clock is going to kill you one day. I'm pretty sure that covers it. Uh, but if I'm wrong, you can find out more about that on the 19th of May. Um, but for now, um, as Chris said, do please get yourself a drink. I would highly recommend.
recommend it. Um, and do enjoy the quiz that one of our volunteers has put together and stick any questions you have in the chat and we'll be back in about five minutes. See you then. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, firstly, thank you to Chris for a great talk. Um, I know for certain that, oh there we go, Chris has um, refreshed a wine glass in the break, so he's uh, more than ready for the questions that you have posed. Um, so I'll just, I'll jump straight in with one of the questions that came through from an audience member. So, um, assuming we agree that formation of life represents a consistent sequence of processes, is it reasonable to be open to the idea that life may have had multiple origin events on Earth? Yeah, I, 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 it, it, I mean, we seem to have a consistent set of biochemistry across all organisms. So the question is, did did the same organism arrive or did the things that happened before the first last universal common ancestor um, arise in multiple places? And I think that must have been a given. I think, you know, reactions between molecules and simpler molecules must have been happening in many places on the early Earth um, and during during that period of Earth history. It's interesting then that we seem to want, we're now to one last universal common ancestor. That doesn't necessarily mean other things weren't there originally and simply got displaced very quickly. I'm, I'm not sure we will ever get a proper handle on that because nothing is preserved from that point of Earth history. I guess if yeah. we fight this on another planet, it may answer that question quite nicely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I suppose it, it makes sense over the... I suppose it, it's hard to think about over those timescales, isn't it? Whether it was one event or multiple and with your the cartoon that you showed with the the amino acids coming together and then splitting apart i suppose there must also be a threshold at some point where there was so many you get to that level and then it just builds up then we have biological organic molecules and they just they build up and build up and we get to where we are today where they're everywhere Yes, and, and there, it, doesn't, it, it takes surprisingly few amino acids to join together to make something which is approaching a functional biomolecule. Um, there's a person, James Milner White at Glasgow University, who looks at that. And I, I think it's sort of, a, it may even be as few as 10 or thereabouts amino acid residues, and a metal center will actually deliver you some sort of useful uh, functionality. So, um, yes. So I, I can imagine that a lot of these proto biological um, molecules were kicking around. Um, on the early Earth. And the question is then, of course, were there multiple forms of simple early life or was it all RNA or, or you know, when the first uh, cellular type structures applied, did they just go around and hoover everything else up and uh, then win out in, in that form? So good question. Um, hard to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose that's the topic really, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, I suppose jumping ahead a bit then, 
Um, this is a, a bit of a, a big question, obviously, where we are in technology and scientifically at the moment, we, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, um, especially considering our cyber next month, check it out, um, that we create machines that might be able to think for themselves um, and have almost a lifelike existence. And then we have things, um, obviously, growing organs um, and organ systems in the lab. That, that's happening quite it's been in the news quite recently. In terms of this, the very basics, taking inorganic compounds and making them organic and creating life, is that something else we need to be worried about? Uh, I, I think we probably do need to be worried about it, yes. Um, and and I, I guess the same thing, um, you'll know better than I probably, the, the same thing was said about the original genetic organisms. I'm trying to think of the name of the uh, scientist that said it. Was it Shergoff? Who said once a, a, a genetically modified organism is released into the environment, there is no recall button. You can never stop it. It will go out and it will replicate. And it's very hard to stop at that point. So... Yes, I think once once you create life and you release it, um, or, or significantly modify life and you release it, then it becomes um, something that is ethically quite challenging to deal with. Yes, I can um, personally attest to that in that I um, did some work on genetically modified fruit flies and they just got everywhere. <laughs> there's <laughs> <laughs> nobody worry it was a sealed lab but um i swallowed a few of them that that did happen but that's fine that's something every now and again when you're working in the lab right <laughs> that's it. And, and there's also the um, law of unforeseen consequences you know people have looked at things like can we modify algae to produce some um, biofuels for us to replace fossil fuels and again it's a single cell organism which is grown in an aquatic environment and if you try to grow them in open ponds, the, the risk of transference is huge. And even if you suggested they were unsuitable to be uh, really, you know, they wouldn't make a good food stock or a, a reproducible organism, you can't say that for certain. And the law of unforeseen consequences is such, such that uh, you, you know, it may do something very unexpected in the environment. And we did some modeling oh, also things at one point. Yeah, it's, it's definitely relevant and it, it needs to be considered. And I guess that there's a lot of ethical consideration, that particularly genetic modification, but some of that hesitancy and sort of pessimism surrounding it has also been quite damaging, um, certainly yeah. in terms of doing foodstuffs that could produce way more food and take up sort of less land and less water, all these sort of things. Um, I know. So certainly, I, I don't think genetic modification um, in food is allowed in the UK. Uh, I might be wrong about that if anyone in the audience knows. Um, but it's it's funny when you take it back to basics and things. Well, it's happening so out there in the wild. It's just swapping genes. It happens a lot in things like bacteria. Um, so where do we draw what is too much? But there is definitely a risk that needs to be considered. Um, another question that has come through, is there a difference between extraterrestrial molecules required for life and those molecules that are found on the Earth? Um, extra, so um, I, I, I take it what you're asking is, um, I think what I think you're asking, and, and maybe I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, is do amino acids on things like meteorites um, hitting the Earth differ from the amino acids we find on Earth. Um, they tend to differ in that. Remember, I talked about chirality. All biological organisms on Earth tend to use one hand or not. Things that are abiotically formed tend to have a very different chiral signature to the ones on Earth. So you can usually discern something. Uh, if you have an assemblage of amino acids that is both L and D form, <clears throat> then you can be sure that it probably wasn't biologically produced. You also get some non-biogenic um, amino acids in these meteorites as well. So they're not ones that are used by biology. So again, that gives you a clue they've been formed by different reactions. So you you mentioned in your talk the various sort of extreme environments that we find here on Earth from highly acidic to highly alkaline, the different pressures and temperatures. Um, are there... Uh, those can be a pretty good representation of what, what we're likely to find sort of in the the near near space um out in the solar system is or is the conditions out there so different that there's not going to be anything comparable if there is something resembling life 
Um, I, that's a good question. Obviously, some some of um, uh, it's not quite my field, but some of the planetary bodies have very different atmospheres, very high pressures of different gases to what we have on Earth, uh, and that might invoke a significantly different biochemistry to the ones we see here. Um, Again, not quite my area, so I wouldn't uh, like to answer quality, uh, sorry, um, fully on that one. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, all of life that we know behaves in a similar way. It, it would be indeed exceptional if somewhere else it behaved very, very differently indeed. Um, but the atmospheric conditions on some of uh, the, the planetary bodies in our solar system are very, very different to they are on Earth. So um, there may be adaptations around that. I suppose that that leads me on to a question that I had. So um, quite a big one. Um, but from your um, geochemistry background in terms of the, the new Mars mission um, perseverance that you mentioned at the start, is there anything you want or love for them to find out there and bring back? Um, I think it would be good to have... <laughs> Oh, sorry, we're just getting a bit of um, feedback here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you and that's you playing your guitar in the background. <laughs> sorry, audience, you, know, you might not have been able to hear that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I've not had that happen to me before in a talk, have you? And that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the, the Mars mission, is there anything oh. you would love for them to find and bring back? So, so there are, yeah, there, there are lots of um, iron-rich phyllosilicates, which are tied to the clay minerals that I work on on Mars. It would be interesting to to have some of those brought back and we can see if there's anything trapped within them. Um, they indicate that the, the atmosphere, they tend to form only where there's water weathering. So we, it gives an indication that there must have been water on Mars. Um, and there are multiple indications for that. But it would be interesting to see if deep within those clay minerals there are trapped any organic molecules. Uh, <laughs> that um, leads me on to a question that has come through. Um, you may or may not know the person that has written this question. Are there any specific clay minerals that are recognised as a possible source of these organic molecules, or is or is it any layered mineral? Yeah, la layered minerals tend to be very good at um, uptaking uh, organic molecules in, into their centre, and and then they protect them from outside conditions. And even when we treat such systems to very high temperatures, some form of amorphous carbon is always left in the middle of them. Uh, so iron-rich clays like non trinites are uh, particularly of interest because where you have iron, you can have different kinds of reduction oxidation chemistry and stabilization going on. So this is all the, the work that your lab is sort of focused on now? Yeah, so, so my lab tends to look at um, more, more the sort of minerals you might get around these alkaline systems on Earth, but also we do do work on um, iron-rich clay minerals as well, but for a different application. But there is a, a very eminent uh, chemist who works also a lot on clays at um, Cambridge University called Nick Tosca, who is, I think, the only British scientist uh, intimately involved in the Mars missions as such. So he's been working on mineral sample collection from those uh, um, from the Mars resources. Oh, so the, I mean, it's good news to think there might be some clay modelling going on on Mars then. <laughs> Just, just the way I'm picturing it. <laughs> um, I, I think that's all of the questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so I just had one final question, um, and it, it is a big one. Um, what do you think came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Oddly enough, we used to do an outreach session with a colleague of mine on this, and uh, um, I think he could argue it both ways. He was an expert. Just, just the fact that. Uh, Eggs um, have been around for much longer than chickens have. Uh, of course, many dinosaurs laid eggs, or and many reptiles, crocodilia, for example, lay eggs, which are soft-shelled eggs. So eggs, eggs come uh, quite long evolutionary before chickens. But then, um, how far into dinosaurs, of course, do avians penetrate the evolutionary lineage? Um, because of course they're quite closely related as well. So uh, yeah, so I, I think he managed to argue it both ways. But overall, he was swaying towards the. Uh, 
the egg came before the chicken because it was an evolutionary feature before chickens were around. <laughs> I, I mean, I personally agree with that. I am team egg. <laughs> Excellent. And that sets you up nicely to be able to eat their uh, eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, um, Chris. I think that is all of the questions that have come in. Um, that was a really interesting talk. And of course, thank you to our audience. Um, if you have any friends or family that you think will enjoy this talk, then you can, of course, um, let them know that it has been recorded um, and it will be added to the Palace of Science YouTube channel for you to enjoy again. Um, in terms of our future talks, as I said, we have our next sidebar coming up on the 19th of May, um, Smart Zombies, all about the Internet of Things. That should be a really interesting talk. Um, and after that, if you want to learn about any of our other events, then, of course, you can follow us on all our social media channels, Facebook, um, Twitter and Instagram and the Palace of Science webpage as well. Um, I think that's everything I have to say to you. So um, I hope you all have a good evening. Um, if you're not currently at the pub, I hope you're all enjoying um, a beer or beverage of your choice. And hopefully I will see you again on the 19th of May. Mm -hmm.